Hello and welcome to Tales of the Wild. I'm Mark, the host of the only podcast where you can learn about the zoology of animal species through stories. In this episode, we'll delve into the shadows to explore the world of one of nature's deadliest assassins. She's a natural-born killer equipped with deadly weapons to unleash upon her prey. But she's not an indiscriminate killer. She follows a code. She specializes in the killing of those who deserve it, those who take away the lives of others. These are her choice of prey, and she excels in hunting them down exclusively. Except when she's very hungry, of course. The life of an assassin can be a lonely one. There's little trust between her and her brethren, but still, she must find a suitable partner to father her offspring. She hates to spend time with others of her kind, but perhaps for the right suitor, she could stomach a dinner date. Welcome to Tales of the Wild. The fly watched in shock as the female he had been courting was quickly snapped out of the air in front of him by the whip-like tongue of a hungry, bulging-eyed frog. The thin line of life and death in the world of arthropods, he thought. There was something poetic about it. No matter, there were plenty more flies in the skies, as they say. He decided to fly away from the pond, lest he also fall victim to that grotesque, slimy beast. He looked forwards, his vision splintered into the distinct hexagonal frames of his omatidia. As he scanned his surroundings, he was happy to see what appeared to be a perfectly clear flight path through the canopy ahead. Freedom at last, he thought. Yes, this was truly a perfect, clear gap into the beautiful sky above. Nothing could prevent me from flying straight through that gap and into the waiting heavens, he thought. He felt so free and uninhibited as he approached the gap. What a joy to be a fly. The power of flight, the freedom of the wing, the unexplored horizons. He was caught. Two of his six legs were stuck to what appeared to be a very fine, sticky mesh. The threads which were invisible to his compound eyes were glued from his femur, which is the highest and thickest segment of the insect leg, through the tibia segment in the middle, and down to the tarsus, which is essentially a hooked foot. He tried to stay calm as he examined the net. Had he not been personally involved in this predicament, he would have marveled at the craftsmanship of the invisible trap in which he found himself ensnared. Beads of glue coated many, but not all, of the threads which made the whole net glisten in the sun like a very delicate giant snowflake. Well, this is odd, he thought. He buzzed his wings, only to find one of them suddenly glued still by another sticky thread. He buzzed again with a single wing, freeing one of his legs but trapping all of the others. He buzzed again, but remained stuck. Had he turned around at this point, he would have noticed a very large, angular black shape zigzagging erratically towards him. Eventually the creature came into his vision and it suddenly dawned on him. Primal fear possessed him as he recognized his kind's greatest threat. An ancient fear deeply ingrained into his core overcame him as he wriggled all of his legs and buzzed his wings rapidly in a panic. His only goal was to get away. With great effort, he felt the glue which coated these threads reach their elastic limit and release their grip on him. And just as the huge arachnid approached him, he was almost free, but not quite. 
one leg was still stuck and holding him back. If he had had the machinery to do so, he would have severed the leg without a second thought. But flies don't have teeth. They have a straw-like mouth called a rostrum, which bends like an elbow in the middle, and ends in a sponge-like organ called a labellum, full of microscopic tubes called pseudotrachea, which suck up liquids. If they do encounter dry solid food, they must first regurgitate a crop full of digestive enzymes before they're able to drink the meal up through this porous labellum. These mouth parts were of no use for cutting. Shh, shh, go to sleep, whispered the spider as it flicked down on a string of silk with amazing precision and speed, and with four of its eight legs, he wrapped several coils of silky thread around the fly's body. You're not the first, and won't be the last. Shh, rest my child, it's over now. This thread was very different to the thread that they were walking on. It was softer and finer, almost comforting. Bizarrely enough, he'd started to relax and accept his fate. The fly's multifaceted eyes gazed into the spider's multiple lifeless eyes, which were quite different to the trapped insect's eyes. The spider's eyes are known as simple eyes, and they were starkly contrasting to the complex hexagonal omatidia of the fly, with just a simple darkness covered in a single lens. The fly was perhaps attempting to establish some kind of connection in his last moments, or desperately searching for a soul in the dark eyes of his captor, but all he saw was an echo of his own demise. demise, demise, demise. This was not a new battle. It was a battle far more ancient than the existence of our own species. Web building, better known as orb weaving spiders, have been around for 250 million years. The rivalry between spiders and flying insects goes back much earlier than that of cats and mice, which like our own species evolved only within the last 7 million years. While continuing to wrap the fly, the spider leaned closer to the fly's rigid chitinous skin and gently sank two pointed fangs emerging from two hairy finger-like chelicerae on the spider's face, deep into the fly. The fly was administered with a lethal injection of venom, which rapidly turned him into a packaged soup. The orb-weaving spider wasn't that hungry, so he continued to wrap the fly to preserve it for a few more days. Once again, the silk that he was using to wrap up his meal was different to the one that he was walking on, and the one he was walking on was different to the one which connected the web to the surrounding trees. Underneath the bandages of webbing, the skin of the fly looked the same as it did before, but even the best entomologist couldn't have recognised the organs inside. A sickening, gurgling sound came from the mummified creature as he was turned into a black goo. The spider began to crawl back to his preferred corner of the web, passing seven other small bundles of silk on the way. He was glad to have another victim. Eight was a sacred number to him. Spiders use their silk for a variety of purposes. They can use it to make net traps to suspend themselves, to glide in currents of wind, to wrap their prey, and to cocoon their eggs. They also use their silk for both chemical and mechanical communication with other spiders using pheromones or vibration. What's interesting is that each of these functions requires a different protein formula to make the optimal silk type, and spiders are equipped with several different types of glands to manufacture different types of silk for different tasks. The evolution of silk spinning spiders is not well understood. There's a huge diversity of the type of insect trapping webs they make. For example, the orb weaving spiders create these big spiraling webs which we're familiar with. But then there's a genus of orb weaver called Scolodorus that builds what's known as a ladder web. This species adds an elongated cross-hatched netting above a typical circular orb. The extension looks a little bit like the net you would see in a circus to catch falling acrobats. 
Their web is specially designed to target moths, which would normally escape a sticky web by shedding their protective scales and flying upwards. The ladder portion keeps the moth tumbling and will trap it when all of the scales have flaked off. Another species from the genus Hypteotes makes what looks like one triangular segment of a complete nest and then stops building. The central point of the triangle extends into one long thread which is held by the spider so that the triangle stretches out. As soon as prey flies into the web, he releases the thread, which causes the web to rapidly collapse around the prey. Many species produce a kind of glue which helps to keep prey in place just long enough for the spider to bite them and wrap them up. Not all webs get their stickiness in the same way. While some webs snag insects with these droplets of glue, others use nanofibers of tangled woolly silk which clings to insect hairs and hooks. So why do spiders have this obsession with silk? It's actually an obsession with food rather than with the webbing itself. In fact, some species don't even use their silk to hunt. Spiders are almost exclusively carnivores, and when I say almost, I mean more than 99.9% .9 of the 40,000 species of spider eat only meat. They usually eat insects, but some species are capable of eating lizards, frogs, birds, fish, and mice. Yes, I did say fish. Spiders in the genus Dolomides commonly known as raft spiders because of their ability to walk on water, will break through the water surface tension to catch small fish near the surface. So what may be more surprising is that there are spiders that rarely eat meat. One is the Bagheera kiplinging jumping spider, which feeds on Belgian bodies growing on the leaves of acacia trees. These Belgian bodies are small masses rich in protein, sugars and fats, and are thought to have evolved as the tree's way of paying the local ant population for protection. This spider has evolved to steal a cut of this rare source of nutrition from the ants, and also it won't stop there. If it notices any ants carrying the larva, it will ambush them and steal the larva, making it a flexitarian rather than a true vegan. Another species from the genus Argyrides is a kleptoparasite. Kleptoparasitism is a form of parasitic feeding which doesn't feed directly off the body of another creature, but instead takes prey or food from another creature. For example, this might include hyenas which often steal the kill of other animals, and some seagulls will steal fish from other birds. This particular spider has a very unusual diet in that it mostly eats the webs of other spiders. If by any chance there's also some prey wrapped up in the web, then this is considered a lucky bonus, but it's not a necessity or the main part of the spider's diet. But these two species are very exceptional, and as I said, the vast majority of spiders are carnivores, and employ an extremely wide variety of hunting strategies in order to find sources of nutrition. As the dawn of the next day approached, the spider, who had been waiting patiently in the corner of his web, started to develop an appetite. He slid down a silk thread and held onto the web with his tarsal claws on the end of each of his eight tarsi, the most distal parts of his leg. He knew exactly which silk strands he'd laid the glue down on and with great dexterity dodged those sticky situations. But even if he did tread on his own glue, he had small specialized non-stick hairs on the tip of each hooked foot, which made getting caught in his own web almost impossible. Despite a bulky abdomen, he moved with the grace and agility of an acrobat. As if he had known the layout of the specific web for as long as his species had existed. He approached the meal he'd caught earlier, which would certainly be nicely digested by now. He liked his food liquidized. In fact, he only ever ate liquidized food. Like all spiders, he didn't have the mouth parts or jaw muscles necessary for chewing. He scuttled closer to the mummified body, but then he froze. He'd noticed something which had chilled him to the core.
much closer to his web and himself than he would have liked. He'd noticed what could be a pair of eyes, because they were several shades darker than the shadows they hid inside, and reflected only a tiny dagger-shaped bead of light on their glossy black surface. They were still with an unwavering and eerie focus full of intent, like the eyes of a tiger before it flushes its prey, but much, much darker. The creature was mostly hidden in the shadow of a crusting off nuggets of tree bark, barely holding on to a dying tree. The spider could not move. In his world, movement when being observed nearly always triggered an attack. After several minutes, he started to wonder if he had actually been seen. Those piercing orbs seemed to be looking right through him. He waited a few more seconds, which felt like hours, and then he decided to slowly go back to the corner of his web. He lifted one of his eight feet, just a fraction, and immediately regretted it. He froze as he sensed but did not see a sudden movement. It was perhaps the subtle vibration of his hairs, or from his web, he couldn't be sure, but he'd noticed it. And this was confirmed when he looked back at the space where those horrific eyes used to be. He had no idea where they were. He looked around with his eight eyes, but couldn't see them. He made his way back to the corner and thought about what had just happened. He had thought he was fast, but this creature moved faster than any living thing he'd ever seen. After a lot of time of doing nothing, he was starting to get quite hungry again, but he was too afraid to go out into his net. He would probably wait until tomorrow instead, he thought. His prey wouldn't be as fresh, but still perfectly edible. He took a nap for a few hours, which in spider terms means sitting still and staring straight ahead and not doing or thinking much, and then he felt a familiar vibration in his net. It was a trapped fly. Instinct took over and he rushed towards the source of the vibrations, abseiling down with excitement as he had done so many times before. As he approached the struggling prey, he could feel the vibrations increase in intensity as the insect was filled with fear of his approach. He was now a mere five centimeters away from the prey, but to his horror, as the prey came into focus, he came face to face with those two black eyes he'd seen earlier. This was no helpless trapped fly. He'd been tricked. The creature that had been stalking him was now out in the open and had drawn him in by vibrating his web. He recognized it immediately. Portia. He knew it was over. He sucked in his last breath through the small spiracles in his abdomen and deep into the spider equivalent of lungs, which are called book lungs because they're made of several air-filled sheets stacked like the pages of a book. Before he could breathe out again, he was struck by a mass that ripped him from his own web landing hard against the tree trunk behind. He felt two sharp pricks sting into the flesh of his abdomen, and then he was released. He looked around, dazed, and started running up the tree trunk. After a few seconds of running, his body started convulsing, and then he was grabbed and stabbed again and again. After ten seconds, the convulsing had stopped, but so had his breathing, and his body was dragged under a crusty nugget of bark attached to a dead tree. She was a juvenile from the unfortunately named ogre-faced spider of the unfortunately named genus Dinopis. She had two giant eyes on the front of her face, framed with what looked like angry eyebrows. She had unusually long and slender legs. She'd just finished building her web. This didn't take very long because the web was almost the same size as her own body. Now that she was done, she didn't climb onto the web, like all weaving spiders would, but rather gripped it with her hooked feet, 
stretched it out like a large, flexible, rectangular canopy in front of her. Unlike the orb-weaving spiders, the ogre-faced spider doesn't use drops of glue coated on the fibres of the web to entrap insects. The fibres are so small in diameter that they're strongly subject to van der Waals molecular attraction forces, and they have a surface that absorbs waxes from the skin of the insect prey on contact. This creates a powerful adhesion without any liquid glue. Now she was ready to wait for passing prey. She used her remaining two hind legs for support as she lowered herself down into the air using a drag line of web. She hung there motionless just above the dry ground and she waited for an insect to pass below so that she could attempt to ensnare it. As she waited there, with unmatched patience, she had a distinct feeling of being watched, but even with her eight eyes, she couldn't see any predators in the area. She shook the feeling off and continued to lower herself down to the ground a little more. She wanted to ensure she was within striking distance of her prey. She would not drop the net, but rather use her long legs to push the net onto her prey. She saw a black beetle coming through the underbrush. The beetle was looking around the leaf litter and eating the mould from decaying leaves. It was getting closer and closer to her. Then it stopped just out of her range after inspecting a dried up leaf and promptly scuttled away very rapidly in the opposite direction. Stupid thing, thought the ogre-faced spider with frustration at missing out on what would have been a very tasty meal. Once again, she had a strange feeling that she was being watched. She looked at the beetle as it disappeared out of focus, and then looked to the ground below her. She saw the dried leaf that had spooked the beetle, and to her shock, she saw two black orbs peering out of it. The eyes were not under the leaf, but the leaf itself seemed to have eyes. She suddenly realised what she was looking at as the dried leaf unfolded in front of her and leapt into the leaves above her. She'd heard about Portia, but had never seen one before. Portia watched her panicking from above. As soon as the angle was right, Portia leapt onto the back of the ogre-faced spider and sunk her fangs in. She held tightly to the larger ogre-faced spider to ensure that she would not get bitten herself or ensnared in the net as the spider succumbed to her venom. Portia is a genus of specialised hunters which targets other spiders. They are the highly versatile assassin of the arachnid world. These killers of killers belong to the family Solticidae, which are commonly known as the aptly named jumping spiders. Like all spiders, they have the famous eight legs, eight eyes, an abdomen, which is sometimes called an opisthosoma in spiders because it differs from insect abdomens in that it also contains the heart, book lungs, and up to 10, but usually less, types of silk gland. Their abdomen ends in a pair of spinnerets. These are two short appendages which are covered in web-producing spigots designed to shoot liquid silk. Silk is one of nature's most incredible products. It is stored as liquid in the silk glands, and when fired, thanks to its sericin coat, which is a water-soluble protective gum, it solidifies in contact with air, forming an extremely flexible strand packed full of smaller nanofibers which give it a tensile strength five times stronger than steel. Over a decade ago now, spider silk protein was produced in the milk of goats by researchers from the University of Wyoming, with the hope that it could one day be used for medical applications, such as for making artificial ligaments and tendons, for eye sutures, or for jaw repair. The silk could also have applications for bulletproof vests and improved car airbags. More recent developments have focused on the difficult task of recreating the actual strands matching the properties of natural spider silk, but without needing the spider to produce it, 
and in the last two to three years there's been some significant progress with this, but we're still in the early phases. The design of spider silk has inspired some interesting research. For example, a paper published in Nature last year described a way to improve on the current designs of prosthetic hands. They state that, compared to transmission systems based on shafts and gears, tendon-driven systems offer a simpler and more dexterous way to transmit actuation force in robotic hands. One of the challenges with this is creating tendons strong enough to continuously resist the force put upon them. The team copied the design of the spider's silk using threaded nanofibers to provide a much improved tensile strength. Additionally, the tendons that they made could carry an electrical current, meaning that there was no need for additional wiring in the hands. While Portia is capable of producing this amazing silk with her spinnerets, she doesn't use it as frequently as other spiders, and not at all for capturing prey. Like other spiders, in addition to her eight legs, she has what looks like two smaller legs near her mouth. These are actually mouth parts called padipalps. They contain sensitive chemical detectors and function as taste and smell organs. This is not the only way that spiders can taste. They actually have taste receptors in their feet, which means they can taste any surface they come into contact with. When it comes to hearing, spiders don't have ears, but rather can detect vibration using the hairs on their legs. This was thought to only detect local sounds up until 2016, where an interdisciplinary team of scientists managed to find a way to test the hearing of spiders based on neural activity of the spider's brain. One of the challenges with measuring brain activity in spiders is that their bodies are pressurized, meaning that any puncture to the skin can result in what the team refer to as a blowout. The way in which postdoc Gil Mender overcame this is described by Ron Hoy, professor of neurobiology and behavior and senior author of the paper. What Gil was able to do um, that nobody else had been able to do is to make recordings um, without causing a blowout of the spider. Now the term blowout is deliberately chosen because the, the body of the spider, like a tire pumped up, at least in, in my day that they were pumped up, um, uh, it's under positive pressure. So what Gill did was to develop a method of making a very tiny hole first in the spider through which he introduced um, an even tinier a metal microelectrode to record from the brain. The team was using this tiny metal electrode to record what was happening inside the spider's brain in response to visual signals shown on the screen in front of it. When setting up the apparatus in the room, it was soon discovered that the spider's brain was responding to the sounds that they were making meters away from the spider. They found that when they clapped their hands, the spider's brain would respond with an electrical signal. So then we went, we, we fine-tuned it, and then Gil and Paul um, used pure tones then to define just what these cells in the brain were tuned to, and they were tuned to quite uh, reasonably narrowly to a range of sounds from about um, 80 hertz to about 130 hertz. This raised the question of what exactly it is that's special about those frequencies for this species and what the team discovered was quite remarkable. Uh, we started talking to, to our colleagues, and, and one of our colleagues, a, a graduate student named Kevin Loop, said, oh, well, didn't you know that, uh, that jumping spiders are their favorite prey of particular kinds of wasps? The, the wasps really prefer jumping spiders, mm -hmm. and so we decided to, mm -hmm. to uh, check out the, the, uh, the flight frequencies of wasps. To confirm this theorized connection, the scientists set up behavioral experiments in which they played the sounds of the wasps to the spiders and observed their behaviors. Additionally, they found that the spiders were indeed hearing the sounds of these wasps using specialized hairs on their legs. Trichobothrial hairs. And, and so these are the hairs that we already know are sensitive to vibrations and they're sensitive to direct touch. It's not possible to see the hairs move, but the team discovered that when the hairs were covered in water, the spider's brain did not show any neuron activity in response to the sound. 
When the water dried up, the brain immediately started responding to the hairs again. So spiders are extremely sensitive to vibrations and can use them to identify different species of prey and also use the vibrations to communicate during courtship. The males of web-building species often woo the females by plucking a species-specific pattern on the female's webs. If a male simply blundered into the female's web without first introducing himself, he would risk becoming her meal instead of her mate. So Portia is in many ways similar to most spiders. You've probably seen a jumping spider yourself, as they are quite common throughout the world. To me, they somehow resemble a crab and move in jerky or jumpy movements. They always have two very large eyes at the center of their head. Portia, however, is the only species found in both Africa and Southeast Asia. She's a relatively small spider at only 15 millimeters in length, but she's perfectly capable of tackling prey up to twice her size. She's famous in the world of zoology for having very advanced hunting strategies and to achieve this, she has several weapons at her disposal. Firstly, she has incredible vision for an animal of her size. Her eight eyes surrounding her head give her an almost 360 degree visual field, although most of it's geared towards motion detection. At the front of her face, she has two specialized eyes called principal eyes, which are considerably larger than the others and provide color vision from red to UV. They have exceptional spatial acuity, being capable of generating a 3D model of their immediate surroundings. She could focus with great accuracy up to 75 centimeters, which is almost unheard of in the invertebrate world. In addition to this remarkable vision, she can hide extremely well. When not hunting or trying to find a mate, Portia adopts what's known as a cryptic rest posture. She moves her legs in close to her body and her pedipalps back besides her two chelicerae, which is the name of the mouthparts which carry the fangs. This alters her shape and makes her visually unrecognizable as something edible, or something predatory, and she waits motionless for time to pass until she gets hungry again. The most important and perhaps most interesting thing about Portia, however, is her mind. She uses advanced tactics when hunting prey, she will frequently move out of the line of sight of her prey, demonstrating something known as object permanence. This is something that's been observed in crows, dogs, cats, monkeys, but it's very rare in invertebrates. For most invertebrates, when an object leaves the subject's sensory limitations, the object ceases to exist for the subject. Portia, on the other hand, knows that there's prey on the other side of the leaf of a different plant and will choose an appropriate attack strategy she will assess every individual situation and respond accordingly. For example, one of her prey items is another spider-eating spider called Skytides. Skytides is not defenseless against Portia. She has an interesting ability to spit sticky venom out of her fangs. For this reason, Portia usually attacks Skytides from the rear, with the exception being when the spitting spider is carrying her eggs to keep them safe. The problem with carrying eggs like that is that it obstructs her ability to spit out venom, and Portia is very well aware of this. Researchers have found that Portia is both more likely to attack these spiders carrying eggs from the front, but also more likely to make an attack in the first place, seemingly knowing that they are less able to defend themselves. So Portia having dispatched two species of spider in one day, the orb-weaving spider and the ogre face spider, would now enter her cryptic resting posture until her next meal. Except that she had other things on her mind. She wanted to hunt down a suitable mate. Eight. Why eight? What's so special about the number eight? All arachnids have eight legs, and almost all of them have eight eyes. 
When it comes to locomotion, even numbers make sense. If you drew a line from the head of a spider to the tip of its abdomen and placed a mirror there, you would see the spider provides a perfect example of bilateral symmetry. The inside of the body is different, but from the outside surface, it can interact optimally and most efficiently with its environment like this. If animals are not bilaterally symmetrical, they're usually radially symmetrical. In this case, you could place a mirror at several angles across the body of the organism and see a perfect copy. This radial symmetry is most often seen in simple aquatic organisms like starfish and sea urchins. Few animals are asymmetrical. Only a few examples come to mind. One is the scale-eating fish, which has evolved a sideways skewed mouth to help them sneak up on unsuspecting larger fish and bite out a scale before making a quick escape. Interestingly, roughly 50% of these fish have a mouth skewed to the left and 50% have a mouth skewed to the right to bypass the advantage the prey would have in anticipating an attack from only one side and also to reduce competition for the most accessible scales. It's a bit like the situation with fuel tank access on cars. Another example of asymmetry in nature is seen in flatfish like flounder or halibut. Their faces are twisted onto one side of the head so that they can keep an eye out, or rather two eyes out, for predators and prey while camouflaging against the sand. They look as though evolutionarily they wanted to be a ray, but came up with the idea too late. Nature prefers symmetries in general because it's easier to produce duplicates of the same thing rather than evolve a new shape or form, and symmetries are simply copies of the same item in a different location so they can share much of the same DNA. In many animals, the importance of symmetry for survival is shown by its strong association with attraction and mate selection. There are theories that suggest dancing evolved as a way of demonstrating physical fitness and bilateral symmetry. So symmetry is important for locomotion, but what about the number eight? They could have six legs or 10 legs, for example. Or insects could have eight legs if this was optimal for locomotion. This is a very difficult question to answer. What we can say is that current traits we see in animals are those that have withstood a long period of stress testing. There are significant differences both genetically and behaviorally between insects and spiders, and it's likely that the lifestyle of the spider is better suited to having eight legs for web walking, chasing down prey, or escaping predation. A few insects, such as the praying mantis, share similar predatory behaviors to spiders but mantids could be the first flatfish of the insect world, on their way to developing those two beneficial extra legs. Similarly, scorpions, which are also arachnids, are perhaps in the process of losing the extra legs. So we don't know exactly, but we can be sure that the answer lies in the complex multivariate trade-offs in energy costs and survival benefits. These eight legs seem to disturb us in a unique way, it's interesting that so many people possess an intense fear of spiders. In this episode, we're talking about jumping spiders, which for some must sound like a terrifying concept, particularly as jumping spiders make up the largest family of all spiders, and they're found all over the world. That being said, none of them are aggressive towards human beings, and very few have fangs long enough to penetrate our skin. None have venom strong enough to cause us harm. So why do we fear them? There is one evolutionary psychology theory that postulates that because of the existence of highly venomous species of spider, by ensuring that their surroundings were free from spiders, arachnophobes would have a reduced risk of being bitten in ancestral environments, giving them a slight advantage over the non-arachnophobes in terms of survival. Spider venom can be deadly, although most of the time it's not. It can be either neurotoxic or cytotoxic, also known as necrotic. Neurotoxic venom overstimulates the production of the neurotransmitters acetylcholine and norepinephrine, causing paralysis of the entire nervous system. The combined effect causes sudden and severe stress to the entire human body. In extreme cases, this can result in death due to respiratory and circulatory failure. Funnel web and black widow spider venom act in this way. On the other hand, necrotic venoms cause damage to tissues such as blisters and lesions, 
Recluse spiders native to the Americas employ this type of venom. In most cases, the amount and concentration of venom used by spiders is designed to immobilize and digest prey and cannot cause significant harm to us human beings. If the threat of venomous spiders were the full story when it comes to explaining arachnophobia, we might expect an equal number of people to be terrified of mosquitoes, which are far more deadly. An alternative theory is that this is a cultural phenomenon which has been passed down through the generations. This is supported by the fact that it's mostly Western societies that exhibit arachnophobia. Generally, spiders don't pose the threat that we give them credit for. Cars and electrical sockets and guns are much more dangerous, and when it comes to animals, mosquitoes top the list by a large margin. It may surprise you to know that there hasn't been one recorded death from a spider bite in Australia since 1979, and your chance of being killed by a spider bite in the US is roughly 1 in 50 million. You would be much more likely to win the lottery. Portia had been waiting in her nest for several days until finally her first suitor arrived. As he approached, she readied herself to attack and kill him. She moved forwards in an instant, and he flicked backwards at the same pace. He shared her speed and vision. She observed him coldly, and he raised his front legs and shook them as if in surrender. She found this endearing and it served to suppress her killer instinct just enough to allow him to come a little closer. He reached the tip of her nest, which was a rather crude carpet of webbing. She decided to give him a chance. She drummed a specific sequence on the web. He copied. Then again. He copied again. The symphony began. Things were going well for this male and you could see his confidence returning after a nervous start. He mounted her, and together they dropped out of the canopy on a drag line of thread. They were suspended in mid-air, and he proceeded to copulate with her, but her killer instinct took hold of her. She lunged at him and overpowered him easily, biting into his flesh with her fangs. Despite the unfortunate end, he'd managed to mate successfully with her in this brief moment of time, and would be the father of hundreds of baby Porsches. 50% would succumb to the same fate as him. It's very common for the male spiders of some species to become body donors at the point of mating. While it's a horrific prospect for our species, which require vast amounts of parental care, for a spider which does not care for its young, it can best serve its offspring by becoming dinner. So here ends the tale. I chose to talk about this genus of spider because of their incredible diversity of hunting strategies. It's very rare to see so much evidence of thinking going on in such a simple animal. During the tale we learned that spiders produce a variety of different types of silks to make different types of webs and for other purposes. We learned about two different types of venom, neurotoxic which attacks the nerves and cytotoxic which attacks the tissues. We learned about some of the unique ways in which different species of spiders capture their prey and theories about the need for eight legs. 
Thank you all for listening. I hope you found this podcast as interesting as I did when I was researching for it. If you did enjoy the episode and are enjoying the podcast in general, please consider sponsoring the podcast via Patreon. You can do this by following the link in the podcast description. Next, we'll embark on a true story where we follow the lives of a herd of large herbivores who found themselves dropped off and abandoned on a small island in the middle of nowhere by a group of upright walking apes. Will there be enough food to survive? Are they really alone on this island? Find out next time on Tales of the Wild.